Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a big welcome to all attendees to this webinar, uh, which is covering the role of original equipment manufacturers in improving the performance of Eskom coal-fired power stations. My name is Chris Yelland, Managing Director at EE Business Intelligence, and I'll be your host and moderator at this webinar, signed in from Johannesburg. A big welcome also to all our presenters who will all be introduced to you in due course. And of course, a big welcome to you, the attendees, for your interest and participation. We have 1,650 delegates registered to attend this webinar today to hear what the presenters have to say. And I think this attests to the relevance of the subject matter being covered as well as the stature of the presenters lined up. May I express a big thanks to all of the presenters for their participation and for the time and effort they've put in in preparing. Please do note that this webinar is being recorded and links to view the webinar on demand and to download the presentations will be made available shortly to all those who registered to attend, as well as publicly. While the presentation is in progress, please do send your questions on the Q&A text facility and not on the chat facility. You may also put up your hands to ask questions verbally using the Zoom hands up facility. We've also set aside 30 minutes after your presentation for our expert presenters to answer just some of your questions. Colleagues, in February 2023, National Treasury announced that it had appointed the German VGBE Energy Consortium to assess and investigate the operation of Eskom's coal fleet. This assessment is due to be concluded at the end of this month. And I certainly hope that their report and recommendations will be made public and not simply buried, hidden from the public and ignored as has happened to such studies in the past. National Treasury said that the outcome of the assessment will consider putting in place a concession model. This could, be, this could see original equipment manufacturers brought in to turn around and improve the energy availability factor and performance of Eskom coal-fired power plants. This is seen as critical to solving the electricity crisis and ending load shedding. The purpose of this webinar is to explore and discuss this matter in more detail. Who are the OEMs? What technical expertise do they bring? What is their track record? And do they see a concession model as a viable prospect? Can original equipment manufacturers help turn around the current crisis and end or at least reduce load shedding? Colleagues, we have experienced severe levels of load shedding throughout 2022 and stage six load shedding virtually nonstop until early June, 2023. The severity of load shedding then reduced somewhat, but load shedding has now returned again with a vengeance and we're experiencing stage six load shedding again today. So there is absolutely no room for complacency. However, we should definitely not fall into a state of despair and helplessness uh, and the feeling that there is nothing that can be done. There are actually only a handful of basket case countries in the world today that experience four to eight hours of load shedding a day for extended periods lasting months or even years. This shows that virtually every country in the world has successfully ensured security of supply without regular load shedding. And there's absolutely no reason whatsoever why South Africa should not be able to do the same, provided we do the right thing for a long time. We have abundant reserves of both natural and human energy. Yes, there are solutions, including improving the performance of Eskom plant, including new generation capacity, including electricity market reform, wheeling, trading, renewable energy, energy storage, 
demand side management and energy efficiency. But today we're going to focus on power plant OEMs and their role in improving the performance of Eskom's coal-fired power stations. And today I have as our uh, opening uh, keynote uh, presenter, Mr. Silas Zimu. He is the special advisor to the Minister of Electricity, and he will make the opening keynote address. So I'm going to introduce uh, Silas now. I see he is online. Uh, welcome, Silas. Uh, if you could switch on your camera, please, Silas, while I do the introduction, while I introduce you. Thank you, Silas. We can see you loud and clear. And if you make sure your microphone is on. Um, and may I introduce Silas as follows. Uh, Silas Zimu obtained a Bachelor of Engineering Honours Degree in Electrical Engineering in 1991. He started at Eskom in 1992, where he worked as an engineer in the Generation Group. He was involved in the normalization of Soweto, and he was appointed contract uh, manager for a number of key projects like Al Yusuf and Matimba Bulawayo, and he was later appointed key customer relations manager looking after the important mining industry. He then joined City Power, rising to the position of managing director. Thereafter, Silas was CEO of Suzlin Wind, Wind Energy South Africa from October 2011. And in June 2015, he was appointed energy advisor to the president of South Africa. And he currently serves as a special advisor to the Minister of Electricity. So a big welcome to Silas. Uh, it's great to have you, uh, and we are looking forward to hearing your words. You, I know you are intimately involved in uh, NECOM and in uh, the work being done to uh, eliminate, uh, let us say, completely eliminate load shedding from the South African uh, environment. Uh, Silas, over to you, and uh, we look forward to hearing your words. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, thank you for the good introduction. You reminded me of my CV, which I had already forgotten. <laughs> but uh, uh, morning, everybody, and and thanks for to Chris and the, uh, the supporters, the sponsors, for arranging this very key, important uh, event. It is key because it's affecting all of us. It is key because there's many of us that can actually help our country to come out of what I call the mess. Others call it the crisis that we are going through. So your contribution as the sponsors uh, has not come late. It's never late to solve the problem. To all the delegates that are attending, I know most of you should have sit, sat in your boardrooms uh, coming up with other solutions, but we appreciate your time to just listen to us. So when did this uh, uh, problem of South Africa start? I think it was in 2008. Uh, then it came back in 2015, and it came back again last year. So as Chris says, are we the only one that are going through this? No, we're not the only ones, but we seem to be the only ones that keep repeating to go back into, into the problem. So what are the challenges? In the appointment of Minister uh, Hossein to Ramkhopa as a Minister of Electricity, he asked me to join him to see what can be done to stop load shedding. Mm. And being a citizen of the country, I had no option but to say, yes, let's do it. But I gave him one condition. There's only a group of people that can solve this problem. And those people are actually sitting at ESCO. So it can be done outside ESCO. And from day one, we hit the road we visited uh, power stations, we spoke to the staff, uh, we were joined by senior executives of ESCOM and thanks for their time. Uh, uh, we didn't plan to do this. So we woke up saying, let's go do this, invited a few people. And, and in going to the power stations, many observations came out. One of the main key observation was that there's less involvement of our OEMs. And having worked at ESCOM, having been in the industry, it raised concerns that um, there's no way that this problem can be resolved with the exclusion of OEMs. But at the same time, there were questions by the staff and some of the leadership to say, the stations that are doing very well, 
are the stations whereby it's the staff that are doing the maintenance. It's the staff that are doing some of the CAPEX work. So it's all in source. The stations that were not doing well were stations where there has been a lot of outsourcing. The question was, have we outsourced to the right people? Then came the response of supply chain. Then came the, 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 the response of saying uh, a black economic empowerment had to be put in place. And then we then realized that uh, we, we, we have a challenge. Our supply chain is not linked to the generation uh, balance scorecard. Our supply chain is geared, obviously, to ensure that there's money spent on local content, whereas the power station manager's balance scorecard was saying, what bring up the, 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 the efficiency, bring up the performance of the plant. But in visiting those stations, we were asking continuously, where are the OEMs? A few OEMs were mentioned. Some of them are in the, in the group. Uh, a lot of OEMs were not mentioned. Surprisingly, our next step was to visit the OEMs. Some of the OEMs, some came to us at the union building. And the observation was that uh, there were OEMs in some of the stations that we've been, but we were not told about. And some of the OEMs were doing a lot of work already uh, for the power stations. But what brought us to where we are? I think when we spoke, we started speaking about the Paris Agreement, the just uh, energy transition. We observed that we were actually shutting down the coal station at a very fast lightning speed. And we were very slow at the speed of a snail to introduce alternatives such as renewable. So we were heading for a disaster. We were heading for a, a deliberate a, a, a blackout. So what we then said was, let's prolong the performance of the coal stations and fast track the introduction of renewables and, and, and other um, uh, sources as per our IRP, as per our energy mix. And that's what actually what then brought back the, the stages down from stage six to, to about two. And I know at the moment we're sitting at stage six, but the guys, the boys and girls at ESCOM are hard at work to say, how do we match the demand that has grown within the past week? So if you look at the generation capacity versus what we're going through now, it's actually the demand that is grown. So what does this jet, uh, jet mean to, to the power stations? There's nowhere in the world where Everybody has shut down their power stations uh, because of jet. They have started by introducing the renewables. They started by introducing other, other sources of energy before they shut down. We were doing the opposite. Hence, we're still saying to the ESCOM leadership, while we are maintaining, while we are doing a lot of CAPEX works at the power stations, let's allow the renewables to come into play. Hence, Minister Mantashe introduced a, a lot of uh, determinations to allow for a fast tracking of other alternative uh, sources to come into play. We can't ignore the fact that the performances of our plant has worsened over the years. But if you look at what causes this uh, performance, if you look at a good example, uh, and, and I'll quote something from uh, uh, Professor Everard on, on the performance, the, he did a very good graph. But that graph also showed that somewhere in 2017, 2018, there was improvement on, on, on these stations. But I, I can tell you um, what we need to do now is to say that is a supply versus a demand on the coal, nuclear, picking, diesel uh, stations that we have. We need to do the same, Chris about our renewable versus the demand. Are the renewables available when we need them? What can we do to ensure that they are available? When are we going to start introducing the storages that we've been talking about for so many years? So it's important that uh, when you look at these uh, assessments, our interpretations should reflect the truth. There's no way that uh, 
whether ESCOM staff or, or OEMs can fix these stations overnight. So what you see as a good performance of 2015, uh, sorry, 2017, 2018, actually started in 2015, when we said to the leadership of ESCOM, here's money, do both your OPEX as in repairs and maintenance and your CAPEX as in refurbishment and replacement at the same time. And after a year and a half, the improvement started coming. We are gonna see improvement. We have seen some of the OEMs doing a lot of work. We've asked them to fast track some of those work. We cannot allow a situation where our consultants, our OEMs are put on the side. Remember, they are also job creators. So as we sideline them, we're not gonna be uh, helping with the issue of unemployment. So what do we need to do? We've got good supply chain procurement processes in ESCOM. We're giving them the opportunity to engage the OEMs. We know some of them are even in court with them. We are watching. Probably we can mediate and, and let the, 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 the judges have some rest. Some of these technical things we're taking to them, really, they don't even understand with all due respect. But the Competition Commission has also given us an exemption to say, if we need to go to an OEM for good reasons, with good reasons, the law now allows us to do that. We have not uh, applied that exemption as yet because we believe that uh, within ESCOM processes, the OEMs can be brought back. The OEMs can help us to, 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 to restore our pride. The OEMs can help ESCOM to again win the awards that they well so much deservedly won over the years. So are we gonna be able to do this without the ESCOM staff? No, we need to train and develop our ESCOM staff. We need to take them out of the system and put them into the OEMs or other institutions to be trained. Technology has changed. As we were visiting the stations, the age of the leadership in the power stations to me, who has been to ESCOM for about 10 years, was another concern. Uh, then the question that I kept asking myself is who trained them? Is it fair to them? Have we set them up? Is it deliberate? Can they be trained? Yes, they're trained, they're trainable. We're all sitting here, we've been trained. And I, and, and I believe that we, a lot of money had to be put on their human capital to ensure that uh, we train our people and we make sure that uh, we come out well. So the, the, the whole world, as Chris says, has been at crossroads. So what have we learned from them? Firstly is they maintain and look after their current existing assets. While they're doing that, they introduce new technologies, including demand side management. While they're doing that, they're very observant of the climate change. And while they're doing that, there's somebody, it all starts with a customer, it ends with a customer. The tariff is very key, it can't be ignored. The affordability is very key, it can't be ignored. Our socioeconomic challenges of this country are very key and can't be ignored. Please, I wanted to prepare a detailed presentation, but having seen Thomas being coming up with a presentation, I didn't want to duplicate some of the slides. A lot of the information that I'm lying with are actually coming from guys like him. And on that note, I would say I'm very, very excited to be part of this. And I would like to say to everybody that uh, the minister unfortunately could not join, but he said, tell Chris you're representing me. We have to be part of this. It's an important event. And I'll be with you through and through to the end. Thank you. Let's enjoy it. Thank you very much indeed, Silas, for those words of encouragement. And uh, I agree with you, you know, when you said uh, that this cannot be fixed without ESCOM. But I think you also added it cannot be fixed without the participation of people like the original equipment manufacturers. I think it can't be fixed without the municipalities playing their rightful role. And it cannot be fixed without the customers of electricity also playing their rightful role. Uh, in, uh, independent power producers, uh, customers becoming uh, prosumers, uh, generating electricity for themselves, as well as generating surplus electricity into the grid. The reality is, I think uh, we're all part of the solution, but I agree with you entirely. 
that the solution cannot be found without ESCOM's active participation because they are a huge and important part of the electricity supply industry as it stands uh, today. So thank you indeed, Silas, for those words. And it's now my pleasure to introduce our next keynote presenter, uh, who is probably well known uh, to some of us who have followed uh, his uh, position. Uh, he was the acting head of generation for a while. And uh, he also participates on a number of the media briefings that's being organized by the uh, National Energy Crisis Committee. Uh, so it's really a great pleasure to have you here, Thomas. Thomas Conradi, who's now the general manager of Generation Engineering at ESCOM. Uh, and if I may uh, say a few words of introduction, uh, Thomas Conradi is the engineering manager for the Generation Division of ESCOM. He started as a systems engineer on the turbine plant at Matla. He joined the commissioning team at Majuba during its construction and uh, its commissioning. And he spent some time as production manager before being appointed maintenance manager at Majuba. From 2003, Thomas was the power station manager at Matla, followed by Creel and Letabo. And he was then appointed as a cluster general manager, overseeing the operations of five of Eskom's power stations. Thomas was recently uh, acting group executive uh, for Eskom's generation division while the position was vacant. And I think you can see from this uh, biography that he has very, very deep experience in the operations at Eskom Generation, uh, right on the ground at the coal face, you might say. Uh, so I, I think uh, we are privileged here today to have Conradi um, give us an opening keynote. And I'd like to hand over to Thomas now uh, to hear his presentation. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you very much, Chris. And thank you for that introduction also. Um, really uh, great for me, and uh, thank you for uh, allowing me the opportunity today to also address this, this webinar. Uh, good morning, ladies and gents, um, and it's great to see, I see over 700 participants currently, and it's, it's good to have all of us together on this very important matter. Uh, firstly, uh, Mr. Zimu, I need to disappoint you that I do not have a presentation, um, but uh, want to rather talk about this and allow opportunity for uh, for others to, to also do their presentations. Um, as you've indicated, Mr. Zimu, we are certainly in a crisis currently uh, with this energy crisis, but for me, it's also very interesting and exciting times in, in us being uh, in the energy sector where we are currently both locally, but also uh, worldwide. And, and things are certainly uh, changing rapidly uh, upon us. Uh, to further spice it up in South Africa, this is all happening in the midst of this energy crisis that we are currently experiencing, uh, where we've got huge shortage of electricity supply and, and uh, we, we see the impact, we see what it's causing, the pain it's causing uh, to, to the economy and the hardship uh, to a lot of South Africans. Um, certainly not what we require at this stage uh, for the South African economy that uh, we, we can least afford uh, this uh, energy crisis and the shortage of electricity uh, where we so desperately need economic growth. Although there are a lot of stakeholders and businesses and other parties in the industry, um, clearly as indicated also by the previous speaker, ESCOM stands very centrally in all of this. Uh, the improvement of the uh, ESCOM generation current fleet, uh, the performance thereof is absolutely critical in order to address this crisis. You will see my background is a, is a cold fire power station. It's not a wind turbine. It's not a, a solar panel. It is a, a cold fire plant. And, and that's uh, where I was uh, born and bred um, all the time in, in the coal industry. And that is going to play a vital role in terms of as continuing with the operations um, and, and being able to turn around the performance of ESCOM. We know that there are a number of factors that has led to this poor performance of the coal fleet and in resulting in the plant. And, and it's largely resulted in the plant being under maintained. We have seen that we require a lot of it, attention to our plants uh, to improve reliability and availability. Um, our auxiliary plants, uh, uh, even our auxiliary plants, we've seen that the performance of that is not good um, and they are not in a good state of repairs. Um, these plants, in many cases, although they might be 
seen as uh, outside plants or you know lesser important plants uh, these plants are in many cases common to a number of generating units and and uh, one of these uh, common plants can cause us uh, you know, a lot of pain in, in, in affecting multiple units uh, and not being able to to produce power we have seen that uh, we require to do significant refurbishment and repairs also on some of our common plants in the past, we have uh, neglected uh, these plants. We have seen how we were caught in having multiple unit impact on some of our power stations where we've got failures of, of common plant areas. Generation has, as part of the, um, of, of the energy crisis uh, and also when the NECAM was established, but even prior to that, uh, um, earlier last year, uh, generation has uh, compiled a very comprehensive recovery plan. Um, we have worked very closely with, uh, with our board and with our executive in ESCOM to refine this uh, recovery plan. And this plan involves uh, addressing some key pertinent issues on the plant, obviously to fix the plant, but we also acknowledge that there are process uh, and people issues um, at power stations within um, ESCOM um, uh, generation that needs to be addressed in order to, to recover our performance and, and get marked improvement, especially on our coal fleet. ESCOM has made use of OEMs for decades, and there's been relationships that's going for many years. Um, yes, we have, uh, in some cases, have moved away from OEMs for, for a number of reasons, but ESCOM wants to continue doing business with our OEMs. We want to increase actually our use of OEMs and as indicated by Mr. Zimu also that there's also the support that we're getting from the Energy Crisis Committee in terms of making use of OEMs in, in also to implement this uh, generation recovery plan and to bring about the turnaround of performance um, at our power stations. We have prioritized uh, uh, six to eight power stations which we want to give really uh, detailed attention where we see that they are carrying the bulk of the unavailability uh, in our fleet. From the historical involvement in our plants, the, the OEMs carry good knowledge of our plants. They've been involved in the design thereof, the construction in many cases. They also carry knowledge in terms of the actual spares, the specification of, of spares, and also the, the much needed design information. And this information becoming even more important um, as we manage the plant life and as we're nearing the second half of the life of our plants, we need to make some risk decisions at times and also how we need to go about in terms of replacement versus repair of plant, where this information from our OEMs is also of, of great need to us. Often the OEMs have a very good local and even international networks that is of great value to us in also assisting us and, and being able to, to get response in terms of supporting in problem solving. Unfortunately, some of our OEMs have not retained their local skills, preventing them from providing a quality service and in some cases also a quick response. Some OEMs have also through time, unfortunately, become very expensive, charging absorbent prices for services and goods. And yes, uh, it has forced ESCOM to also consider alternative suppliers to provide an equal, or in some cases, even a better quality product or service that is affordable to us. And in some cases, even being delivered quicker. So yes, we've uh, experienced delayed responses on queries and commercial inquiries from some of our OEMs and that and also some long lead times on spares. And that again negatively impact our plant recovery and availability, especially when we need to, to manage downtime on, on our plants. Contract negotiations and uh, getting agreements on NEC terms and conditions has been in some cases a painful process and taking long for us and uh, and then we need to renegotiate 
some of these are multiple times on, on very similar scopes uh, at same stations or at, at different stations. I believe it will be very good for, for both parties, for all parties, and to negotiate some sorts of framework agreements that, uh, that can be used on different contracts and that will speed up the commercial process and, uh, and contract agreements. Over and above providing a maintenance service and spare parts, um, there's, there's more that we require of our OEMs. And we expect OEMs to also assist us uh, with engineering decision-making um, and on scope of work, but also to assist in risk, uh, risk management and risk decisions when we need to, uh, to operate plant that might have some defect on it. Unfortunately, our OEMs have in many cases allowed their local and even foreign engineering skills to have diminished to such an extent that they are, are not able to provide such a service to us. And, and uh, that's actually, you know, for us uh, of concern also, where in some of the, the engineering know-how and backing and the designs of these plants are not that uh, um, easily obtainable anymore. We live in a very scarce uh, times. Money is very scarce. Um, unfortunately, we need to spend a large amount of money in running open cycle gas turbines. And then clearly we need to also get that money to be spent on our plant. And, and uh, we are really looking at all means to secure enough funding for our plants. But it also asks of us to to now be more than ever need to be much more efficient with the use of money, how we apply and where we apply our existing funds, to consider where we do these investments on which plant areas and what, where we will get the best return on that investment. That requires of, of us to carefully consider the scope of work that we need to execute. And as I've indicated earlier, also here where we want to involve our OEMs to assist us in, in actually coming up with the best scope, but also how we can do more cost effective. How can we execute our scopes better? We have seen significant price increase um, and, and increases in costing um, of maintenance, especially our outages um, over time. And, and we need to see how we can become more cost effective. But Eskom is not only a, and Eskom Generation is not only a business for today, but we certainly also want to be in future a business. And we cannot only focus on the current crisis, although that is of utmost importance. But we also need to invest some energy and attention and money in improving the current fleet, but then also in what we're doing into the future. We need to look at what we need to do to our plants. Certainly the international tendency is to move away from carbon-based energy production, as we all know, also as part of the decarbonization. And we know that the bulk of Eskom Generation's fleet is cold fire power stations. And therefore we acknowledge that, you know, things will need to change and change significantly also for Eskom Generation in the near future. So although there is a move away from cold fire plants, and as Mr. Zimu indicated, we will still require these plants for many, many years to come. And in the transition of, of energy, it's a matter of us being able to continue running the coal fleet till its uh, end of life, but also to allow them the renewable energy generation and other means to, to come um, to fruition that we can then get a better energy mix. Our OEMs and suppliers in the energy sector certainly also need to adapt to this uh, changing energy landscape in which we find ourselves. We believe that the OEMs can play a significant role in assisting ESCOM in this transformation. We will need to see how we better and best utilize our existing assets to participate in future energy markets. We will need to be able to compete in a very competitive market for energy. 
our generating plants, and that's been seen also in the rest of the world. Uh, for coal fire plants, we will need to be able to be much more flexible in how we operate them. How are we being able to, to really be able to competitively participate in the energy market and new markets that's coming about, for instance, the ancillary markets, voltage and frequency control, balancing market, grid inertia. So the question is, how do we need to modify and apply our assets to be best suited? Our OEMs can certainly also assist us in this transition. ESCOM wants to contract and partner with the OEMs, not only to improve our current plant performance, but also to set ourselves up for the future. We want to also engage into longer term contract agreements. We are moving away from just a short term ad hoc and order by order basis, but negotiate longer term contracts with OEMs and other suppliers. And that is also to allow our OEMs to build up the necessary skill and capability and competencies in order to be able to offer us a better value proposition. We believe that then we can also negotiate better pricing and being in a better position to have a win-win a contracting with our OEMs over a longer period. But we also want our OEMs not only to supply resources and material, but to share in our risks, also taking full accountability for the scopes that they are contracted to execute. And with that, to, to set up our contracts such that there is room for reward, but also for penalty for good and poor performance. We must uh, create relationships where we, which is based on trust and integrity that can really be of mutual benefit to both parties. I hope that also through this uh, webinar that we will start more dialogue in growing valuable and important relationships um, between suppliers and ESCOM and different stakeholders within this industry. Uh, many thanks uh, for affording me this opportunity and I wish you all well also in this exciting journey in which we find ourselves currently in the energy sector. Uh, thank you very much and back to you, Chris. Thank you very much, Thomas, for those words. And um, I kind of got a, a message that whilst Eskim is currently obviously dealing with a, a significant crisis with its existing fleet, and uh, it is also starting to turn its mind to what it takes to become a utility of the future. And Thomas, you've alluded to uh, the need to decarbonize. Uh, and uh, Silas has also alluded to this and uh, indicated that this needs to be done in a way uh, that ensures that we can proceed continuously uh, and not uh, have a massive disruption uh, in supply. So it's really critical uh, that whilst one is uh, putting one's mind to the future, uh, that one continues to maintain and service the existing plant uh, so that there's a, a phased and a seamless transition uh, as we move uh, to uh, uh, South Africa where we are decarbonizing. So I, I think the important messages that I took from both Silas and, um, uh, and Thomas uh, was this need to do things in a carefully planned way um, uh, that is um, consistent and progressive and uh, moves uh, at, 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 you know, at a, in a way that does not uh, jeopardize uh, our economic future, but actually secures our economic future. Uh, and that is really the challenge. Uh, and, and, and I'm pleased to see that ESCOM are in fact looking now to becoming a utility of the future. And that is of course the subject I'm sure of some of our future webinars. Uh, but now uh, having um, uh, concluded with our keynote presentations, um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker and move on to really the uh, meat of the uh, messages that are going to come from uh, the, uh, the OEMs themselves uh, before we get into uh, an open discussion. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, and uh, uh, Deva Govinda, 
uh, Deva is probably well known to many of us uh, because uh, he has been uh, with Eskom Generation uh, for, for many years. And uh, if I may uh, introduce him and say that Deva Governor started his career at Eskom after completing a BSc engineering degree in chemistry and uh, biochemistry, a BSc degree rather in uh, chemistry and biochemistry, and an honors degree in energy studies. Uh, he then completed the advanced management program at Harvard Business School. And at Eskom, uh, Deva has been the power station manager, a general manager and CEO at Rotec and Roshcon. He's been the group executive for Eskom Generation, Transmission and Customer Services. In other words, three important um, divisions over a period of time at Eskom. And um, he was the acting group executive for sustainability and risk. And after 29 years at Eskom, uh, Deva joined Babcock International as CEO uh, of Babcock and Tuleco Engineering, uh, the South African wing of, um, uh, of Babcock International. So uh, a great pleasure to you uh, uh, to introduce you, uh, Deva. Over to you. Okay, thank you, Chris. Uh, it is a bit of a shine on me here. Unfortunately, the lighting is the sun changes direction here, so apologies for that. But maybe it's a bit brighter. Maybe that's what we need to focus on, the bright things. Um, thank you very much, Chris. Um, first of all, thank you for setting this up. Uh, thank you to all the colleagues that are participating today. Um, really uh, privileged to be among the people that are talking today. Also to thank the audience that have joined. And uh, I also would like to thank and acknowledge all the people in uh, Babcock that helped contribute to the presentation that I'll be doing today. Uh, led by our GM engineering, Albert Siliers. So I will be covering and, uh, quite a few topics, but I'll not be going through every slide because like Chris said, the, the slides will be available and I'll be touching on some salient points. Having listened to Thomas and to, uh, to Silas, it looks like I will be visualizing a lot what Thomas said, which he, which he, which he verbalized. Um, I'll be covering three parts in my presentation. The first one is about uh, who are OEMs, what, are, what, what, what do they do? Uh, because it's always a, a misconception of who OEMs are. The, the second part is what does Babcock bring to the table as an OEM? And the third one is about the electricity crisis, or as Silas put it, a mess. And uh, basically about the concession model and about uh, what can uh, OEMs um, doing solving the electricity crisis. So a lot of the speakers focused on this before, uh, of OEMs. Um, I think the key issues on this slide here is the, the crucial aspect of the steam generation industry is a significant value that's brought by original equipment manufacturers. And I think uh, OEMs play a pivotal role in shaping the future of steam generation. OEMs are indispensable uh, that's the key word I want to give you on this slide. And I think the, the word, other word is uh, there must be a symbiotic relationship with a client where there is mutual benefit. It cannot be a one-way street in terms of the benefits. There has to be mutual advantage. Um, the expertise, the technological advancements, the commitment to customer satisfaction contribute to the overall growth and success of the industries. And that's one of the key issues that OEMs actually bring to the table. So understanding OEMs, uh, who are OEMs? It's a company that designs, supplies, manufactures, constructs, commissions, maintains specialized equipment and components, providing a sustainable guarantee upon its operational uh, capability. Very important, they are providers of comprehensive solutions tailored to specific industry needs. They drive innovation, they have access to cutting edge technologies. They are also promoting sustainability and environmental stewardship and providing solutions that comply with environmental regulations and industry standards for emission reduction. Why is it so important that we need OEMs? What makes them so indispensable? Partnership with end users are developed and customized solutions to optimize performance, provision of expert engineering and technical support they also help in the risk, as Thomas mentioned, to help the clients evaluate the risk and actually advise in terms of operating plant at risk. 
implementation of predictive maintenance strategies to perform, to minimize downtime and maximize productivity. Cost effectiveness, obviously the significant capital investments that happen that will ensure a substantial return on investment at the later stage. Some of these ones that investments come into is supply chain management optimization, standardization, modular replacements, long-term maintenance contracts, continuous improvement and innovation. Key issue as well is enhanced safety measures and reduced environmental impact. OEMs play a crucial and multifaceted role in the steam generation industry. One of the controversial and contentious issues is always about uh, the cost, and Thomas highlighted this, and he used the word expensive. Uh, OEMs bring back value that will not happen overnight. It will not be a quick, quick solution. When you invest in a, a long-term relationship with an OEM partnership, it will result in a positive RII, ROI. In choosing the OEM, you actually invest in a superior performance that will be over a long period of time that comes with a guarantee. It is someone that will just not come and do the work and disappear and leave. And then that is sometimes that misconception where the expensive component comes. OEMs are always available to discuss and negotiate when it comes to pricing. But I think the key message I also want to give you is, as OEMs, considering our structure and the expertise we deliver, we will not be able to compete price for price with small, some of the very smaller companies. And I'll come to the role of how smaller companies fit in the bigger picture. We also find that when you, when you take over a plant, one of our recent experiences, when we were the OEM, we built the plant, and then we were replaced with someone else who was much more cheaper to perform the maintenance. Uh, when we are asked to come back to fix the plant, the plant is actually in a very poor state and the expectations are very high that it must be done immediately and in a very short time, which is sometimes unrealistic. But what we also find is that the plant has significant inefficiencies and load losses because the plant has actually been modified. And when we sit with the drawings that we've built, we see it's different. And we now have to bring that plant back to design status but also incorporate all the changes and the variables that have come about as a result, for example, poor pole quality. So in summary, OEMs, key issue is OEMs in the steam industry lies in the expertise, innovation, comprehensive solutions. Engaging with OEMs provide access to specialized expertise, reliable and customized solutions, technological advancements, life cycle support, support, and compliance assurance. These benefits contribute to improved operational efficiency, enhanced reliability, and optimized performance. Key issue L as well is what Thomas mentioned about the design, the access to intellectual property, and the legacy requirements. So the concluding slide on this part about OEMs is in the blue block, block in terms of what an OEM offers key things that uh, an OEM offers that can be teased out of that block in the blue is what, what was mentioned earlier by one of the speakers is local technical expertise and capabilities, avoiding the need for imported services, assistance in implementing improved maintenance philosophies, thorough inspections and reviews, engineering enabling uh, uh, contracts to ex expedite procurement of critical skills, advice on international best practices to ensure to, to ensure pressure part materials, quality and cost management, advice and backing from OEMs in terms of risk-based decisions, resident engineering functions, or on-site on -site support and collaboration with the client. And I'll come back to this key issue of uh, resident engineering functions. So this is the key issue that OEMs actually, uh, what they do, why we need them, and what they can offer. So what does Babcock, bring to the table. This is basically the combustion value chain. And together with, this is what we, what we sell. Uh, we also have supplier development programs. And this is where I mentioned, we have, there's a place for everyone in this industry, not OEMs. It's all contractors and suppliers. We also have, ensure capacity building and training. We direct and empower opportunities for local SMEs, micro enterprises, and QSEs. 
Babcock's expertise, design, build, maintain. We offer a comprehensive solution hub. It's basically a, simply put, a one-stop shop service. It is crucial, one of our key issues is it's crucial that we put priority on safety. We normally say there are three things that's important to us. The first one is safety, the second one is safety, and the third one is safety. Safety always comes first. It is crucial to adhere to the strict safety standards, implement proper designs and construction practices and conduct regular inspections. Regular inspections, maintenance, safety protocols are essential to ensure the integrity of the steam line and prevent any accidents. And it's important that we, we focus on this issue. This is one of our key competencies. It's, it's about the high pressures and temperatures that we operate our power plants. Uh, if you think about it, uh, your, your car tire pressure is at 2.5 bar. The pressures that are operated on a boiler is anything from 180 bar. And something to think about, um, the, the Titan sub that actually uh, very unfortunately resulted in loss of life and that imploded was a result of, of, uh, of, of pressure that actually crushed that, that, uh, sub, uh, that submersible. And we do not quite know what happened, but the same thing happens in a power station. When that, that steam line, those high pressure boilers and the steam line carrying the steam from boiler to the turbine actually rupture. Steam is at a pressure and temperature it's superheated at 540 degrees, sometimes higher than that, five times the boiling point of water. So a main steam failure has a similar quick reaction to the surrounding environment due to its pressure and temperature. So it's something that is absolutely critical at power stations that sometimes not taken seriously, but taken seriously when we have a failure and we, unfortunately, sometimes you may have loss of life as well. Who is Babcock? This is our proud history in the country. You can read this at your leisure. It dates back to over 150 years in terms of all the firsts that happened in the world around boilers. Uh, so we've been in the country very long. We've built power stations. We've maintained all of, uh, power stations. We've also supplied boilers to a wide variety of in industries, including the power, the iron and steel, the wood, the paper, pulp, sugar, and other industries. Babcock, what do we do? Uh, we do long-term boiler maintenance contracts. Uh, we had an unbroken track record of providing maintenance services to four stations up to the 8th of December, 2021. We do HP piping replacements. We executed two stations um, and Babcock's the only company as far as we are aware that has successfully executed a main, full main steam uh, system replacement from boiler to turbine. We've done NOx abatement projects at petrochemical plants. We brought the emissions down uh, as low as 40% uh, below the legal requirements for NOx. We have proud ourselves in the low well repair rate that we have. And we've also reduced boiler tube leaks significantly with boiler element modular replacements. Um, as Babcock, we uh, have our OEM services. We have to have expertise to handle maintenance. Next slide. Sorry. We have uh, expertise to handle maintenance, modifications, upgrades, projects on our power stations. We've also done repairs on two uh, stations, which we, we were not the OEMs, Kendall Power Station. We successfully managed a long-term maintenance contract at Kendall Power Station until the 8th of December, 2021. We've done the timber power station, a significant project where we replaced the mainstream pipe, piping. So those are some of the examples that we have and where we bring our expertise. We've also have access to international uh, expertise. We have uh, our partnerships, strategic partnerships with Babcock and Wilcox. Like what uh, Silas says, we also do not only provide services on the conventional thermal boiler power plant, but also on renewables and on environmental side. We also, have the we also have the license to sell and market diamond power, soot lower, uh, spares and valves, as well as maintenance and, and any other uh, issues on soot lowers via the diamond power product. We also have other technology partners. And here we can help uh, utilities with programs where 
uh, we can input data, your operating data into programs. We can tell you what is wrong with your, your where's, what's the problem in your combustion value chain, where the key issues are. You can change parameters like coal. So these are all what we bring in from an international perspective. Together with our parent company, uh, Cavendish Nuclear, we bring world cutting edge leading technology in welding technology as well, and in nuclear technology as well. So we come to the third part, addressing the electricity crisis and uh, load shedding. Uh, so here, we, if you look at the unplanned capability loss factor in generation, it's a function of 30% due to force shutdowns, 10% due to outage delays, 40% due to load losses, inefficiencies, 20% on planned shutdowns. So 80% of the unavailability is, is due to unplanned events. It's not due to insufficient uh, energy capacity. We have that availability. The OEM support has been devalued and the ability to effectively support is impacted due to sometimes unrealistic expectations of OEMs. Uh, the, the annual cost of operating uh, ESCOM's open cycle gas turbines is like 15 billion uh, rand. But to get an OEM engineering service is around uh, 50 million to 100 million rand a year. So this is where the resident engineer comes in, plays a crucial role in day-to-day -day activities. And we certainly encourage ESCOM to have that capability of having OEM resident engineers on site. Um, key issues in addressing the energy crisis, Thomas already spoke about its maintenance philosophies, its plant health, its improved project execution and collaboration. Uh, it's about establishing plant health forums. It's about communicating more with the client, having smaller groups. And I'll come back to how we can work as a collective in helping uh, ESCOM with a crisis we find ourselves in. Spares, availability, contract, project management, consignment stock. We find ourselves in a unique situation that uh, some small suppliers will come to us for OEM spares, and by the time it gets to ESCOM, ESCOM is paying a premium of close to 200% sometimes. Capitalize on previous investments, life uh, cost savings. We did a lot of work where there was a lot of uh, LifeX projects that were done. So we need to capitalize on all that, that work. A concession model, is it a viable solution? A uh, lot of uh, benefits, a lot of drawbacks. And I'll leave this slide, Chris, to the discussion when we open for discussion. I think there's, there's a lot to be shared around this and I can expand on this further. Sorry. So the issue of pricing we also discussed, and I think that was a key issue that needs to be debated. A uh, lot of issues you can go around in terms of pricing mechanism. I'm sure OEMs are open totally to that, so are we. So overall concessional model, there are benefits, but there are drawbacks. And then my last one is summary. I think it's a conclusion. It's a call to action. It's, it's all hands on deck. Uh, these are the key issues that OEMs would bring listed above, but I also want to re-emphasize ESCOM on their own cannot, it cannot be expected that ESCOM on its own can solve the crisis. They, they, need, they need the help of everyone. We cannot have OEM sitting on the sidelines while we have unprecedented load shedding with cascading impact on the economy of the country. ESCOM needs all the help they can. And I think you need to get all the OEMs, all the executives of the OEMs together need to hold them accountable for what they need to deliver and maybe why they haven't delivering it. And as a collective, I am sure we can address the crisis. And that's the value that OEMs can bring to a crisis we find ourselves in. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Deva, for those insights um, and for giving us a very clear picture of um, who these OEMs are what, what is an OEM uh, and the kind of skills that you've outlined, kind of resources that you bring to the table, uh, both from international technology partners uh, through to the local company, which is a BEE level one uh, company indicating uh, that it's deeply embedded in the fabric of South African society uh, and um, and also, I, I think a point you made, Deborah, was that 
uh, it's not just the big OEMs, um, but they have within their scope uh, interactions with a lot of smaller companies uh, and developing SMMEs uh, to become part of this ecosystem uh, that is there to serve uh, the industry. And I, a lot of questions I've seen on, 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 on the, on, on the Q&A uh, have been around, uh, you know, what are the opportunities uh, for small SMMEs, developing SMMEs, uh, and medium-sized companies to, to become part of this ecosystem. They want to be part of it. And I, I think we'll talk to that uh, a little later as to the work that is being done, because it's not just about the big OEMs, uh, as I see it. Uh, it's about the big, the international, the, lo the big locals, and the way in which the big local uh, OEMs can integrate these uh, smaller suppliers into the supply chain without compromising <laughs> the price to the, 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 the end customer. In other words, the services that are provided need to be value adding services and not simply price gouging services. And one needs to be careful that one develops the right kind of skills um, in the smaller companies uh, because they can play a very important role in the whole process. Uh, they are much more flexible and nimble and a lot of the OEMs use smaller companies to do a whole range of work. Uh, and that helps develop uh, smaller companies, become more skilled, uh, upskilling them to become medium-sized companies, and ultimately to become big big uh, parts of the South African economy. So thanks for, for those uh, words, uh, Deva. And we've had a great uh, start uh, with presentations uh, from Silas Zemo, the special advisor to the Minister of Electricity. Um, we've had uh, Thomas Conradi, who's the head of uh, generation engineering at ESCOM. And um, we've heard from Deva Govinda, who's the CEO uh, at Babcock in South Africa, uh, one of the leading OEMs in, in the country. Uh, it's now time now to move on to our next presenter. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, Tabu Molakoa, who is the chairman and managing director from Siemens Energy, uh, Southern Africa. Um, Tabo, I've known you for some time uh, from your former company, and uh, great to see you at Siemens um, Energy now. Uh, Tabo is a qualified mechanical engineer with an MBA. He has more than 20 years professional experience in technical, industrial, and maintenance projects. And uh, he teams uh, to, to form growth strategies in over 40 countries. He serves on several boards in South Africa and was previously on the European Union Business Chamber Board. His experience covers organizations including Tyson Krupp, DuPont, St. Gobain, I hope I pronounced that right, <laughs> and De Beers Mines. And Tabo is currently the Managing Director of Siemens Energy Southern Africa. It's a great honor to have you with us, Tabo. Uh, I think you're signing in all the way from Luanda in Angola. And um, welcome back to South Africa, <laughs> uh, at least for this webinar. And I'm sure we'll see you around in Joburg uh, soon as well. Over to you, Tabo. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, uh, bon dia, I suppose, uh, for those who understand Portuguese. Uh, I'm greatly honored and, and I think uh, to represent Siemens Energy on this, this platform and also to speak to you today. Uh, this is a very, uh, sometimes could be quite an emotive topic, especially around OEMs and OEMs uh, perhaps seen as uh, taking away um, what could be seen to be localization opportunities. I just think that OEMs are an integral part of modern industry. Um, I think they can provide uh, quite a competitive uh, pricing if we have to look at economies of scale. Uh, they also can encourage technology innovation, uh, help to maintain uh, the right uh, high quality of standards, especially in industries. Uh, and I just think for, for power plants, the, the smooth operation and maintenance of these facilities is quite crucial, especially for performance and longevity. So um, the best practice that they, they could bring could contribute to some of the uh, challenges that we see on um, AF. So um, without further ado, I think to, to introduce a little bit, um, I'll, I'll cover three sections. 
the first one, I think it's important for me to, to reintroduce uh, ourselves. So um, what you normally would see uh, out there are three separately listed uh, Siemens uh, affiliated or Siemens companies uh, operating quite independently. So we uh, were carved out of the middle one, which is the Siemens that we all know uh, that's been in the country for over 150 years or so. Um, in 2020, and our sole being is actually to focus on the energy transition. So conversations about where we are at and how do we then um, traverse that journey to get into uh, a low carbon economy, low carbon energy systems. So that's in essence where we are. Um, we, we are present in, in over 90 countries and um, part of our focus in, in decarbonization is to ensure even our products become uh, decarbonized in order for us to support the energy transition. Um, how we are structured, we one of the few entities that is uh, fully integrated along the energy value chain. So um, in gas services, that's where we believe that gas is going to be a bridge around energy transition. And that's where we also do a lot of generation, anything from medium size to, to uh, utility scale. And grid technology is really around how do you evacuate uh, that energy that you have produced. And then we have a division that focuses on transformation of industries. This is how do you decarbonize industrial applications and we partner or, uh, or develop this with our customers. And, and one of our other businesses is so recently fully uh, now incorporated in, in, into Siemens Energy is Siemens Gamesa which obviously then focuses on um, the wind turbine and wind energy sector. In a different uh, view, um, this is all the industries or areas that we cover. We are headquartered in Midrand. Uh, we've had a, a manufacturing and, and assembly facility in Wadeville. I'll talk a little bit about that later on. But we're a proud level one contributor and have been for past two to three years, so by existence. And um, we, we contribute even beyond uh, that certification requirement. Uh, who we are in terms of footprint, we um, essentially we cover anything from um, the ESCOM uh, core fleet. Uh, so be it the uh, turbines, the turbines and generators, to um, wind turbines that we, we have uh, from the various renewable energy rounds, to the peakers uh, that are quite topical of late. Um, and also uh, something which we're proud about is the, the CSP plants that, that we have in country that we also are supporting the uh, majority of them with uh, long-term maintenance programs. Um, and then also from a transmission plant, we, we have a, a number of uh, transformers at various generating stations. Um, and you can see the figures there from, from step-up transformers all the way to distribution transformers. And also quite uh, unique, uh, actually it's quite unique globally that uh, from a control system perspective, we have call it one of the greatest concentration of um, skill sets and, and footprint of uh, our control system sitting in South Africa. So 78% of all coal power plants um, is supported by our technology. And also to round off in terms of the work that we do, we also focus on some of the social aspects and I'll, I'll give a little bit more around that. Um, as I said, uh, on a social front, I think, um, and this is sometimes something that is often not seen and, and maybe assumed or perhaps um, not well spoken of, is the view around what we do in society. So we, we do anything from uh, various trainings that we have an annually take for, for apprentices, engineers in trainings, uh, commercials, so business administrators, um, we also do uh, participate in corporate social um, engagements um, and, and learners and education. So last year we did our uh, 
a youth just energy uh, transition hackathon where we talk about the various technologies and you know ask youth to contribute to conversations around, um, for instance, in Pumalanga, how could in Pumalanga transition? What are the options? And what are the some of the pros and cons of some of the options that we want to take and so on? I think one thing that I'm, two things that I'm proud of, I think the first one is uh, the technical training front, you'll see on the right, it's a Power Academy that we opened up about two years ago. And this Power Academy really, it, it used to be training that was offered out of Europe. And because of the concentration of the install base that we have, we have managed to be able to pull that down to South Africa. And what's more instrumental about that is that it covers now SADC. So we have people coming out of from Botswana, different countries and so on, Botswana, neighboring countries, to try and attend where in the past it would have been one or two to try and to travel up to, to Europe. And last year, which we piloted also uh, scaling up uh, SMMEs. This was specifically in our control systems business um, as a model to see how do we expand uh, on some of these skill sets up to other smaller entities. So into the, the core of the conversation. Um, so I think the, 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 I listened uh, quite carefully to, to the previous keynotes um, around what, what actually are the issues and how they see uh, the role of OEMs. Um, what you see is, is kind of how we, we look at our support base, but if you take out, lift out the key details, it's, it's three things for me. One, it's a performance uh, enhancements. Um, the second part could be around maintenance services we provide for the various assets that are there. And more importantly, uh, training. I think we, we, we underestimate what that training means, and perhaps even now starting to feel the impacts of uh, not that long-term approach. But one thing also I want to uh, highlight across, call it the generation transmission and control system side, is the, the importance of long-term service agreements. And I think uh, Baba also touched on it as well. Um, the, these agreements ensures that we can retain the skills. And beyond retaining of skills is also, it opens up opportunities for jobs to be created. And the, the one thing that we often don't see in uh, a lot of these long-term service agreements is that it provides predictable pricing. If you're asking me to have a relationship over the number of years uh, on specific equipment, I'm able to see and predict the outlook of the spares and thereby able to plan appropriately. And there you can benefit from predictability of, of those and, and also improve on pricing. Two last things is online uh, monitoring or call it continuous monitoring. The continuous monitoring uh, could come either remotely or, or, or even online as well. But, but that enhances how we make smaller continuous improvements because I'm closer to the equipment and therefore are able to offer uh, call it a continuous support and so on. And the last one that seems to have diminished over the years and we do see the impact is that um, best practices are easily shared when we have a long-standing relationship. Um, I give an example that um, at the moment, uh, what we are seeing globally, there's conversations around, for instance, cyber security of power stations. And I don't think we talk enough about some of these things because of currently where we are focused on. But if we had allowed ourselves to get into these long-standing relationships, we'll be able to easily cross-share some of these references and best practices that we see uh, happening globally and the trends that could be impacting uh, our sector. Um, in terms of the install base that I had just shared, uh, I wanted to touch on a couple of things without going to specific. So in terms of the turbines and generator um, plants or where we have our install base, I think we see an importance on maintaining uh, megawatts, especially on um, end of life units. I think uh, uh, Silas also did talk about um, some of these power plants needs to, the life needs to be prolonged because of the planning was not in sync. 
but also what is becomes in, becomes crucially important, especially on, on, on these uh, assets, is around planning, especially from a sparse requirement perspective because of the age of those assets and also uh, improved outage duration. And, and I'll touch a little bit on that because um, that, that seems to have uh, emanated in different caucuses around um, how do we plan better uh, around outages and how do we ensure that we can bring back the units on time and so on. Um, and so for, so for that, in terms of our, our, our turbines and generators, um, I think the, the, the partnering can ensure a proper mobilization of the skills that we require, especially here, uh, commissioning engineers. And that's conversations that we often uh, bring about. On the control systems, um, this is perhaps something that um, it, it is clear, but it maybe might not be that obvious, is that some of these systems that are there are legacy technology systems. So therefore, a uh, risk of, of silicense uh, exists. Uh, therefore, I mean, meaning that limited support, uh, limited spares in some cases, um, and that poses a risk around maintaining um, your plants and so on. On the transmission side, it's largely the transformers. There, I think the concern becomes around have you adequately covered um, spares um, and is maintenance adequately uh, done, especially for um, the units that are coming out of warranties and so on. That, that needs to be fully looked at in order to do the full coverage. So on our side, um, one of the things that we we try and to to try and get closer to this is around the, our service center that we have. So we've got about just over five thousand, uh, five and a half thousand square meters of a, of a service center. We do various things there, of Wadeville. Um, so we cover anything from uh, the normal manufacturing of components, welding and so on, and I'll show some specifics there. Um, but we're able to disassemble, inspect, repair, and overhaul uh, table machineries, fabricate, um, and that becomes quite easier to, to then look at the support and, and the project management plan because of, of the techni technical expertise that's sitting there. And we do have an engineering unit that is able to uh, even do uh, prototyping um, of some of these units. Uh, some of the experience that we've gathered over the years and therefore are, are able to locally do this, um, anything from seal scares, bearings. Um, uh, the reason I put this for me is that these, uh, these local manufactured uh, components enable us to then work with other uh, smaller enterprises, other smaller uh, entities along the value chain, and therefore also creating uh, the necessary jobs that we're looking for, but also the necessary economic activity that exists. So in OEM like ourselves, if we're removed out of uh, the very needs that are required, uh, it does not only impact on jobs and the jobs that we create and opportunities and SMEs, but it also impacts on some of the other players that we are so uh, symbiotically, I think, are connected to. How I see our role going forward, I, I think the, the, there are a number of uh, ways we could look at it, uh, but I think the, the essence of it for me is around how do we have a, a much more constructive relationship about uh, spare parts, uh, diagnostic services and engineering services, and this was touched on. Uh, there's a lot of modernization upgrades that needs to happen. Uh, a lot of performance enhancement progress that needs to happen. Um, and also a lot of, um, especially from a controls and uh, instrumentation perspective or controls and instrument uh, items, that we do need uh, to improve the performance therefrom because it does impact on, on the um, availability of, of our fleet. And I think once we can get into a conversation around uh, all these parts on a longer term perspective, it then opens up um, more sustainable opportunities on how do we uh, train, 
what is our pipeline look like and how do we ensure that we don't use the skills that are there because given the energy transition trends that we see, we as well are unable to keep some of the key members that we, we have because they are globally in demand and, and therefore um, uh, will move if, if there are opportunities that presents, are presented to themselves. Um, the parts that I'm talking about, I think they, they are not new to ourselves. I think we, we have seen some successes uh, over the years in working uh, together. And, and I've just listed some of the things that I think are, were common themes in getting to some of these successes. So space management um, was certainly one of those. A joint outage planning is quite important. Um, someone did talk about procurement. I think we need a lot more agility in procurement, especially for the assets that we're trying to maintain. Project management skills, ongoing train, training. And those are some of the themes that, that have come across over the years and, and driven by a strong long-term partnership um, that it enables us to bring the, the competence a close hand uh, to the benefit of not only ESCO, but I think to the country given the impact of um, this fleet. I leave it there, Chris. Um, that's it from our side. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, as well, uh, um, Tabo. Really interesting presentation. And, um, you know, you touched on this business of remote um, online support and monitoring. And we're just seeing an example today of this kind of ability to work from remote. Uh, Tabu, of course, signing in from uh, from, from from Luanda, uh, and uh, it's it's really incredible. I find the technology uh, that enables uh, collaboration across uh, previous boundaries um, that uh, that we're able to deal with now. And it applies to all manner of remote monitoring of plant, uh, of wind turbines, uh, of solar PV installations, of gas turbines. And, um, and, and I think Siemens is uh, a very active role, both in the control and instrumentation, digitization, um, remote monitoring, uh, you know, you know it, it brings a new, a new aspect to this whole question. Uh, of being able to economically identify problems and dispatch the right people, the right equipment, the right spares to the right place, the right time. Um, and, and that's the kind of thing that we see in this modern world as we need to move away from the old way of doing things uh, to become you know, progressive utilities of, of the future, using all the modern tools uh, in the toolbox to do just that. Um, and, and the other thing that, uh, that I think came very strongly through from Tabu's presentation, and it answers so many of the questions that I've seen uh, as to, you know, what are the opportunities for SMEs and small business, uh, you know, they also want to be part of the action. And you mentioned, uh, you know, the whole training aspect, uh, the use of smaller companies for supplies of things like seals, uh, gears, specialized uh, machining, bearings, turbines and compressors and specialized small items. There seems to me to be a wealth uh, of opportunities in the supply chain. It's not only about the big uh, companies, although they do bring significant research and development and skills to the table and resources and ability to train, but it does open the door uh, to uh, to the whole um, uh, you know to the whole value supply chain. So um, thanks very much for Tabo, uh, and it's now my pleasure to introduce our last speaker, and that is Ewart Snayman. Uh, who is currently uh, the uh, engineering manager for the utility boiler business at John Thompson. Uh, John Thompson is a division of Actom, one of the biggest local manufacturers uh, of electrical equipment in, in South Africa. Uh, he started as a systems engineer working for Eskom at uh, Creel Power Stations. And can you see how every one of our speakers <laughs> has had Eskom as a mentor and as a trainer, you know, where they cut their teeth and got their skills over the years. And Ibert is one of them, as is, uh, as, 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 as was uh, uh, Deborah Govinda. Uh, and um, yeah, well done to Eskom for being an incubator, uh, you know, feed, feeding skills into the OEMs as well. And then uh, their knowledge, able to bring, uh, you know, the, the technology from the OEMs back 
to Eskom. So I think it's a kind of a, a circular chain of, of, of activity. So if it uh, was the systems engineer working at uh, Creole power stations, looking after boiler pressure parts, he then moved to Steinmuller in 2001, where he was involved in several projects for Eskim, including the redesign of boiler components, the return to service of older stations, high pressure piping maintenance activities, failure investigations. And in 2015, he moved to Actom, uh, remaining involved with the maintenance activities on utility scale boilers, using all the knowledge that he'd gained from Eskim, uh, now combining it with knowledge from OEMs, bringing it back to Eskim in the circular uh, process. So thank you very much, Ewit, and over to you. Thank you, Chris. Um, thank you for this opportunity and thank you for arranging this uh, event. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, speaking last after a series of uh, speakers like this is, is, is not easy, um, but I think I've got some value to add as well. Um, I just want to sketch a bit of history around the OEMs for all the ESCOM plants. Um, most of the ESCOM coal power stations were built during the 1970s, 80s, and that late, like early 90s. And there was a period of about 15 years where no construction work was performed. Now, the market for these boilers has changed significantly over the past 40 years. Uh, internationally, the demand has dropped quite significantly. And during the 15 years in South Africa, there was also a significant change uh, because all the companies involved in this work had to change um, the way they work due to different types of work and also different uh, volumes of work. The, these factors had a significant impact on how businesses were structured. Many companies were bought by others only to be sold again or partially sold. For example, uh, the now local Actum was under Alstom. Um, Alstom bought companies like Siva, which designed the timber, and also Stein Industries, which supplied many of the mills. Uh, ICAL, uh, International Combustion Africa Limited, was also part of some of the transactions. This resulted in many companies that are supporting ESCOM in terms of maintenance and has the know-how, but no longer effectively owns the original technology. So how do we find an OEM? I think it's consistent with what was presented earlier. A company that is able to design, manufacture, extract, operate and obtain type of plant or equipment in question, be that boiler, a turbine, transformer, milling plant, doesn't matter what you, you consider. And John Thompson, as a division of Actum, uh, is fully capable and continue to do just that. We do obviously the smaller boilers, but also industrial boilers and, and uh, utility scale boilers. Um, <clears throat> Actum supplies various products and services to ESCOM um, and has a very wide range of, of products, uh, not just on the boiler side, but electrical and, and is 100% local. Uh, Actum is currently 100% locally owned, uh, various shareholders. Um, but um, they also invest in South Africa heavily and is thus a the e uh, yeah, level one contributor as well. John Thompson is a division of Actum, which I'm currently working for, um, and performs the maintenance of the boiler pressure parts and high pressure piping at six power stations. Uh, we are replacing critical boiler components during outages and specialize in welding. Um, and we have a very, very good relationship with ESCOM. There are many ESCOM engineers and managers that are extremely dedicated. And it's those people that we, we build these relationships with. Um, now, the boilers are constructed of materials that can operate at elevated temperatures and require specialized welding procedures, skilled personnel, and careful management to perform the maintenance activities within these requirements. 
That's both legal requirements and ESCOM requirements. Without our current and continued involvement, the performance of the power stations would be much worse. And I think that's true for many of the OEMs that's involved at the power stations. Here's just some of the, the work that we are doing, um, replacing panels uh, of the boiler walls at the power stations and a main steam weld ready to be uh, welded. Now the question comes up, what can be done? Um, I think that's really the crux of this webinar. There are many problems that ESCOM is facing. As we believe that we are well positioned to discuss technical uh, issues experienced, I will attempt to highlight some of the challenges that we as Actum have observed on the ESCOM sites. Note that none of these are new. They have been identified by various role players, including the Minister of Electricity. And I mean, we've, we've heard that earlier in the webinar. One of the main things that we've seen um, is the availability of materials. Uh, materials are not always available for maintenance activities. Availability may delay the return to service of the units. And the quantities available may also result in reduced scope of work. Our current contract does not include the supply of materials, uh, but only the consumables. And there are many other contracts with ESCOM that's um, similar, be that on the milling plant or um, on the uh, precips or any of the other equipment. Uh, boiler piping and tubing are free issue from ESCOM for our contract. Uh, we have noticed that in some instances, ESCOM is struggling to obtain the materials required for the maintenance in time. Uh, these issues results in extended outage times and possible tube failures, since the required scope could not be executed. Uh, these tube failures result in units being taken down uh, for maintenance, and it is least convenient to do so. Uh, and this has a negative impact, obviously, on the energy availability factor. How should, or what's the options of addressing this, this specific issue? Um, ESCO must find a way to obtain the required spares on time. And, and I think uh, earlier, Silas, he also indicated that this is some of the issues that uh, they've identified in terms of the old procurement process within ESCO. But, by including, for example, the space within the boiler maintenance or mill maintenance contracts, um, that or a lot of these issues may be resolved. Um, it may also be better to create long-term supply contracts, enabling contracts to supply materials, uh, making the commercial process also a lot easier. There may be various other possible solutions that ESCOM uh, is considering at this point in time, and those should also be further investigated. Then a bit more technical. I think it's necessary to understand that for a boiler, there's many systems uh, for a total power station unit that needs to operate. Um, and all of these systems must be supporting each other. Um, and the maintenance of each of these systems are critical to the total performance of the plant. Um, for example, if the main milling plant that's measuring the amount of coal that's in going in, that's um, grinding the coal to a fine powder, is not running well, it will affect the whole downstream process of heat transfer to the different boiler components, as well as the outlet ducting. Um, and that forms a critical part. But when you consider less um, 
important systems, like I've mentioned, um, for the example, the water treatment plants, um, that can have a direct impact on the operation of the plant if there's not sufficient clean water available to start the boiler after an outage, for example, or after uh, emergency uh, repairs. <clears throat> Now, all these systems um, is not necessarily backup systems, so it becomes even more critical that these uh, are maintained correctly uh, because if one of these fail, the whole system fails. Now, obviously, if a boiler is shut down um, for maintenance, be that planned maintenance or emergency repairs, before you can start the system, uh, the correct repairs must be completed um, and the correct material must be available to do that as per the first. Um, and I think although the aging of the plants as shown in some of the statistics is not necessarily a controlling factor, it definitely does have a, a big impact on the attention and dedication required. Um, currently, more than half of the generating capacity that is not available, we've seen that over the last couple of months, is not due to units that are shut down for failure or for maintenance, but rather partial load losses due to the plant that is not performing. And um, some of these issues are coming from the separation of contracts. Um, Many of the maintenance contracts, as we are, uh, have stated, are limited in scope. Uh, the boiler serve contract, for example, focuses purely on the boiler pressure parts and the pipe. Um, it does limit it to a single system or process. Um, contracts are measured on the maintenance activity performance. So, for example, the amount of welds being done, uh, the performance of the welding in terms of uh, weld repair act. Um, and it's not li linked to the performance of the entire plant, where you look at the availability, the reliability, and the actual performance figures in terms of reaching uh, full load uh, where needed. Our proposal in this case is uh, that contracts should include more of the boiler and ancillary equipment for the uh, boiler contract, for example and then change the KPIs uh, to focus on the availability of the plant and the performance of the plant. <clears throat> um, then the load shedding that the country is uh, currently being exposed to is placed ESCOM under tremendous pressure. Because of these pressures, the focus has shifted uh, on site specifically from good practices like long-term planning, uh, proper failure investigations, uh, proper training of personnel, uh, to finding the quickest solution to get the plant running in the short term. Um, so then also the uh, performance of the plant to some extent is being neglected because if the unit is running, at least power is being produced. It may not necessarily be at, at full load. Um, so many of the engineers involved um, and also the maintenance staff have limited time to focus on these good practices. Um, so, and I think that's been said before, um, many of the units um, that are not available uh, currently within the ESCOM fleet for longer periods, for example, the, the three units at Kusile, um, are directly related to operational errors. And that, again, may relate to, to training, uh, but also maybe the, the focus of uh, the personnel on site. All power stations are under immense pressure to produce power. And, and that really um, <clears throat> changes the, the way things are being done. If we look at how ESCO performed in the 90s, 
where they were focused on, or the target was 90% availability, 3% unplanned, 7% planned uh, shutdowns. Um, they had spare capacity. They were able to focus on the right things because the plant was not under such pressure to perform. Um, and in terms of supporting ESCOM and its current challenges, uh, and that was stated by the two previous uh, presentations as well, uh, I think Thomas Conradi also mentioned that, that the expertise available from the OEMs must be utilized to improve the performance of the plant. I think there's a lot of additional uh, expertise available that um, is not being fully utilized under the current scenario. Um, we are working tirelessly with ESCOM to resolve the load shedding crisis in the country is facing at the moment. Um, we at Actum, as a the bigger organization, but also at John Thompson specifically for uh, the boiler plant, have the expertise and the personnel to assist ESCOM in achieving these goals. We also believe that the industry will be able to weather the storm and provide stable electricity uh, to South Africa in the future. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, thank you, um, Ewart, for, for, for that. Uh, and, and your slide uh, that showed, you know, the complexity of the coal-fired power plant system. Uh, you know, everything from, you know, input coal conveyors, the mills, fans, pumps, uh, boilers, high-pressure piping, turbines, generators, cooling, auxiliaries, control systems as... Tabo mentioned, and, and even the output transformers to the, the grid, paint a very complex picture uh, that has to be uh, properly uh, maintained uh, throughout its entire service life. Uh, a very complex process indeed. I have no doubts that the role of the OEM is uh, critically important in, in the system, but that doesn't mean that there are other players that are not also equally important. Uh, but to think you know, that one can uh, exclude the OEMs uh, you know, who have very detailed knowledge about the equipment they've supplied and how it is used in its life and uh, how it should be treated uh, would be very short-sighted in, in, in my mind. Uh, but what a, a very interesting and practical set of solutions that you have presented that need to be focused on. So thank you very much, Everett, for those insights coming from your long experience uh, in this business. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the presentations uh, for today. It's five to uh, 11 at the moment. So that leaves about half an hour uh, for some open discussion and Q&A. And there are lots and lots and lots of questions on the Q&A. Uh, so we're not going to be able to get through them all, but I've been trying to monitor them as they come in and uh, would like to perhaps sort of combine a number of questions rather than just read out a question and get an answer, read out a question and get an answer. Uh, so I'd like to just tackle uh, a few of the, uh, the, the, the bigger points. And, and one of them, I think, has been well covered already, and I don't want to dwell on it, um, and that is you know, uh, how, how, how do smaller players get involved um, and become part of the ecosystem? And I think this has been well dealt with by every single one of the presenters. They, all of them, all of these OEMs that we've had presenting today are level one BEE contributors in the South African economy. That means they're deeply embedded in the South African economy and, and, and uh, have, have uh, roles to play and play roles uh, you know, in equity, in ensuring the right demographics uh, within their business and training, ownership, uh, socioeconomic development, and all of those things that go towards making a level one contributor. Uh, and, and I think we can see, and I, I can see that the OEMs are indeed playing a very much local role. In addition to their international uh, context, technology context, which they also bring to the table. But there are many seems to me there are many opportunities 
uh, for smaller companies to uh, to work together with the OEMs. In fact, the OEMs cannot operate without these smaller companies providing all manner of parts and services and machining and goodness knows what uh, that is part of the overall uh, service uh, offering. So I, I wonder. What, I think we've touched on that and dealt dealt with it. I hope. Um, a point that has been made loud and clear in Irit's last presentation was the question of, um, of this, the, the availability of materials. And this gets to the supply chain. It gets to uh, the procurement problems that Eskom face, uh, problems with um, uh, you know malpractices within the procurement departments, uh, overpricing of parts, uh, kickbacks, corruption, uh, you name it. I think it's been well aired, you know, in many um, public documents and uh, forums uh, about the, the, this, this level of criminality that is a kind of a symbiotic relationship between the suppliers and the middlemen and the um, uh, and Eskom itself. Uh, it's not, one can't point a finger only at one or the other. Uh, but I'd like to to just touch on this point, uh, starting with Irwit, and then maybe others might want to come in. Uh, and uh, if I can ask, please, all the presenters to switch on their cameras and, uh, so that they can uh, come in and be ready to switch on their mics. Uh, but uh, Irwit, um, do I mean, are, are you seeing this supply chain problems uh, relating to procurement irregularities? Uh, as, as a big part of the problem and remembering also that it's not just an Eskom problem, it takes two to tango uh, and, and where Eskom uh, may be having some malpractices, there are also suppliers that have malpractices, uh, middlemen and uh, people that are climbing in on the BEE legislation, uh, buying parts, uh, spares and selling them at outrageous prices with some collusion from the, 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 uh, for, 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 from the Eskom procurement people. To what extent are you seeing this in your operation, Irwet? <clears throat> Look, most of the, the materials that we are getting free issue from ESCOM is fairly large items and it's, it's bulk supply and, and, and it's critical. Uh, the specifications of these items are, are absolutely critical. Um, and thus, I think the, the level of corruption there is, is a lot less and, and uh, not such a big problem as maybe some of the other smaller, more common items. Um, some of the materials ESCOM is really struggling to get because it's just not being manufactured. They need to buy minimum quantities from the mills, the steel mills, to be able to obtain uh, these materials. And it's becoming a, a bigger and bigger problem for ESCOM uh, to, to obtain these. And that's why the, the lead time may also be significant. So maybe in our case, the, the problem is a little bit different than, than some of the other uh, supply issues that ESCOM are facing at this point in time. Um, we are also trying to assist in that because we are building relationship with international suppliers to try and, and supply this equipment. Saying that, we are still getting inquiries from small companies uh, um, instead of directly from ESCOM to supply uh, some of the, the space uh, of, of smaller items, let's say the, the tube shields, for example. Um, so we are still seeing some of these things happening. Uh, look, if some of these companies help the process uh, with ESCOM and enable small companies to contribute to the economy, this is not a big issue, but for them to add a 200% margin on that and then sell it to ESCOM, I guess is, is, is where the, the problem starts. They add really high um, uh, rates yeah. to the to the to the price. Yeah. Well, th th thanks, uh, and and I'd like to bring Thomas in at this point, if I may. Uh, Thomas, you know, we heard about at a particular power station that spares that were supposed to have been delivered, uh, you know, just seemed not to exist uh, when they were needed. Obviously, some kind of um, uh, you know, fraud or corruption going on. Um, to what extent is this hampering, you know, the Eskom's drive to, uh, to, to get on top of load shedding and to get maintenance done properly, you know, if spares are either running late 
or are missing. I mean, Eric has talked about, you know, that they're not available on time, not at the right quantity sometimes. And sometimes I guess they're just not even there because of, 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 of some fraud in the background. Are you getting on top of this yet, Thomas? Thank you. Uh, certainly space is a critical component towards um, recovering of our plants also. Um, and and in, in some cases we do have a situation where uh, the recovery of a plant component or plant area is, is hampered by not having that spear available. Um, they, we've had um, uh, problems uh, in terms of our management of material and um, the whole stores management and inventory management at, at power stations and we are uh, busy with a, a project also and investing in terms of both technologies but also improving the process of better control of spares um, uh, from the from the receiving through the stores process the inventory management thereof um, I, I think we've allowed ourselves to become ill-disciplined in terms of of utilizing spares and not necessarily accounting for it accurately so it's not necessary to say that it, it relates to uh, to corrupt activities. Yes, we have had cases where uh, corruption have also resulted in, in, in uh, that there's colluding in terms of space uh, being um, indicated as delivered, but not delivered, and then giving a false sense of, of space availability. Um, our approach is, is uh, uh, we have seen in the past also that our supply chain management is hampered in that uh, a supplier would uh, would uh, get the tender for um, supplying a spear, um, and uh, then you know, for whatever reason, the supplier then either is late in delivering that spear, or even on on when really getting too close to the delivery date, actually then to um, you know to, uh, to to cancel or to withdraw and saying that he's not in a position anymore to provide the spear, only for us to start afresh with that uh, procurement process. Um, so we have uh, certainly now um, much more moving towards uh, utilizing the original manufacturer of that spear and go to, to that supplier directly in terms of providing that spear, uh, where it's a spear that can be um, you know, easily procured from multiple sources, then uh, to, uh, to, to more approach the, the open market in terms of that but where we don't have value adding intermediate intermediaries in terms of spares, um, you know, we, we avoid those and we go directly to, uh, to the one that uh, manufactures the spear. Thanks. Yeah, thanks very much, um, uh, Thomas. Obviously an ongoing uh, work that has to be worked on continuously. Um, I'm gonna move to a question by Paul Tucson, uh, a consultant uh, who would like an update on uh, you know you know the level of sabotage, uh, deliberate or acts of emission or acts of commission against equipment uh, supplied by uh, no doubt by some original equipment manufacturer or other, uh, and and uh, how how this is impacting? Is this is this a real issue that you're experiencing as OEMs? Uh, and, and, and and what kind of levels of oversight mechanisms can be put in place, security and oversight mechanisms to protect your equipment, uh, because ultimately it comes back to bite you. And maybe I can uh, move uh, to um, uh, to Tabo uh, Morakoa for his comments, and also then uh, Deva Governor for his comments uh, about uh, you know how is sabotage impacting your role as an OEM. Um, yeah, because I'm not sure <laughs> with the, the, the sabotage element. I think one of the points that I, I we want to, to use, which could be relevant here, was the point around the continuous monitoring. And, and I think uh, if you move on to, uh, I suppose, uh, best practices around maintenance, you can get into this realm of uh, a lot more frequent and continuous monitoring, which, which then could could alert you of issues that, that happen in real time and also um, the best practices that will be followed. But from, but from our end, I mean, we haven't seen, uh, no could, could comment on uh, sabotage at the plants and so on. Yeah. Uh, Deva, do you want to come in here at this point? Thank you, Chris. So um, on the issue of sabotage, uh, we did have uh, an example where 
we did experience it when we were asked to take over a plant. And when we took over, quite clearly, we struggled from day one. Things that were not prevalent was happening immediately uh, when we took over. And uh, we really battled. It took us time to stabilize that plant to get the performance back where it was. And we struggled along together with ESCOM. Uh, obviously, when that happens, the, the OEM obviously uh, gets blamed for that. And we 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 accepted that to say we have to work together with ESCOM to sort that out. But it took us time and there was a lot of damage done in, in that period. So yes, there are examples, but I think working together with ESCOM, we've we've managed to sort it out from a practical example. Yeah, Silas, I hope you are still there. Um, if you could switch on your camera, if you're able to answer this one. Um, are you still there, Silas? Ah, yes, I see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Silas, uh, can I just, uh, I mean, we know that at the uh, National Energy Crisis Committee, they have a work stream looking at security issues, uh, you know, that relate to the different power stations. And we know that, I mean, even the army was deployed uh, at one stage. I'm not sure if they still deploy it uh, at the power stations, but uh, can you give us an, perhaps an update on the security uh, situation? Obviously, we're not asking you to reveal anything that would compromise security, but um, uh, can yeah. you give us any indication of the successes that are being had, uh, if any, and uh, whether you're still requiring the services of the army to uh, provide some kind of oversight mechanism? Yeah, um, Chris, thanks for the for the question. It's it's a very relevant um, question. The army is still at the power stations. Um, there were a lot of questions when they were deployed whether they are needed or not. But you know, the the visible policing seems to be prevailing. And and a good example is what we did for the Soccer World Cup 2010. We had visible police everywhere, and we didn't have crime and sabotage. So uh, I, I would personally say their services should continue. Uh, they're very aggressive, they're scary, but maybe we need that. And even myself, when I have to go in there, you know, uh, I have to take out all my cards, my ID, and the guys don't talk, they just say, show who you are. But uh, we're getting a lot of whistleblowers, uh, there are elements of um, corruption, more of corruption than sabotage. Some of the sabotage things that have come up as sabotage, even the security work stream things, it's probably ill training, not really sabotage. We haven't got into a, 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 a evident situation where we say this was sabotage. Uh, but um, the, the security agencies are are doing a good job. There's a lot of information that has not been disclosed. So they're disclosing it to myself and the minister up to now for security reasons. Uh, but I think uh, if anybody has got any information on what could be a, a corrupt element, they should notify us. I mean, we are available. We listen to those Every day, actually, on Monday morning from seven o'clock till nine o'clock, we're getting whistleblowers that are so adamant. They even say we want to tell you in your face. It's no more a secret as to who we are. So people are now having that interest of getting the power stations to work. So if the OEMs also see something that they think should be notified to the authorities, we we we, we are there. It's not an easy uh, topic to discuss, uh, 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 Chris. But that's why we took a cabinet memo to say to cabinet, we want ESCOM to be able to deal directly with OEMs. And some people thought we actually pushing BEs away. No, 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 we're not. There could be BEs out there that are still working at ESCOM, but we can't allow the ones that are now coming in with 200% markup. You know, you have a, 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 an OEM in, in, in Boxback nearest to the Mpumalanga power stations supplying through a middleman in Mosel Bay, in Mosel Bay, uh, with a 300% uh, markup. That can't be allowed. Whether I'm white or black, that can't be allowed and should not be allowed. This is a regulated industry. The tariffs don't increase and reduce as we wish. So the price must follow our tariff structure as well. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um... Uh, Silas. 
Uh, I, I want to change the subject a bit. There have been uh, various questions asked on this, and I'd like to sort of lump them together and, and deal with it uh, at once. And that is, I mean, part, part, part of this webinar has asked the question as to, uh, you, you know, we know the Treasury announced uh, that uh, they wanted, in fact, they made it a con. Of several, a couple of hundred billion rand bailout, um, that Eskom should no longer um, build new uh, power stations uh, and that the existing uh, coal-fired power stations should be concessioned out to external operators. And I want to ask the question, you know, what actually is the benefit of doing this? Uh, is, is there really a benefit of, of having uh, you know, of these power stations being operated as a concession by external operators, and and what role uh, do the OEMs play in this new model that is being presented by National Treasury? Uh, you know, where where would, uh, would, would I mean, is the old model where basically the utility contracts with OEMs either on a short or long term basis, uh, or whether the, these uh, power stations are operated on a concession? Uh, and, and, and the concessionaire engages with the OEMs. I, I'd like the different views on this matter because it hasn't really come across as much as I hoped it would in this uh, particular uh, webinar. And this is the opportunity I'd like to open it up. So perhaps let's start off uh, with, uh, with, with Deva Govinda. Uh, Deva, what are your views on the role of OEMs in this different model where uh, where the power stations are concessioned out to external operators. Okay, thank you, Chris. So, uh, see, your memory is good. I did have it in my presentation on slide um, 18 and 19 and 20. I said we'd probably leave it for a discussion. Um, it's very difficult to, to understand, you know, with the, the, the note that came out from National Treasury to say concession and how the model would work. But if you had to summarize, I think, uh, there's a couple of scenarios. One is this long-term relationship with OEMs. Uh, obviously, it, it must be a win-win uh, relationship, but also a pain and gain, gain um, contract as well. But there are a lot of advantages. Uh, it's long-term partnering relationship. It's a collaborative, it's strategic partnership for alignment with performance objectives. Expertise and integrated team. Uh, it's combining local with international technology teams together with ESCOM resources, technology partners. The academia plays a role in it as well. It's risk sharing, it's allocation of roles and responsibilities, and you know quite clearly who's responsible, what are the outputs, and you'll know whether you are moving in the right direction or not because there, there will be KPIs, there will be metrics measuring. Uh, there will be financial investment for critical maintenance. Uh, there will be investment by the OEMs in resources because they know that there is now a long-term relationship in terms of how this so-called concession model would work. Uh, it brings in productivity savings. Uh, there's an internal procurement process now that takes place that doesn't that uh, eliminates duplication of uh, functions. And especially on the procurement side, you can engage now with the technical people when, when there's requirements from ESCOM. Always you have to sort of get blocked at the commercial stage and uh, at the commercial functions. You cannot go beyond that to get clarity. But there's also flexibility of discussions and I think openness to customize the concession model. But there are drawbacks and, and risks. And I think one of the key issues is the unemployment risk because there will be a perception when these OEMs or whoever gets a concession model will reduce staff, uh, displace ESCOM personnel, bring their own people in. Uh, the dependency on a single vendor and obviously financial risks, uh, transfer people perceive, uh, labor organization perceives it as a, a transfer of public assets into private hands. So it needs to be done. And obviously there's this political and regulatory risk that come about. So I think those are things that are all in the pot, but once that report comes out and the concession issues are more clear, I think that's the best input I can give. Thanks. I'd like to just move to Thomas now. Uh, Thomas, uh, I mean, I have heard that Eskom was considering maybe doing a pilot at one or two power stations of this concession model um, and rather than just implementing it across the board as um, uh, as the national treasury sort of conditionality on finance seemed to imply that you know that this would be required across the board 
Um, and uh, but as I say, I know that Eskom was perhaps looking at this, uh, you know, on a limited basis as a sort of a pilot to see how it worked. Can you give us perhaps an update on on the thinking, uh, you know, of this concession model and how it could be implemented and will it be implemented? Has it got to be implemented? We just left a little bit in the dark and uh, any clarification that you can provide would be very useful. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Chris. Uh, certainly, uh, in, in, in closer par, um, cooperation with, uh, with service providers, with OEMs, in order for them to also take up part of plant or a complete plant has been given consideration. It, it, it obviously comes with complexities if you take a part of your plant where you've got uh, dependence on spares that you need to use across the fleet and processes of how to int uh, integrate that. So um, it, it, it rather will work better if one go for a, a complete plant area. Um, you might know or not know, but uh, we have considered, for instance, in Drina Power Station, um, to uh, when we get to the point of of there taking that and, and make that available to um, uh, to an independent uh, private uh, person in, in or, or group to to actually operate and, and maintain uh, that asset. Um, whereas we understand that uh, with that complexities, we are more at the stage considering uh, maybe taking specific uh, plant areas. Um, or specific areas that one can better ring fence and, and get, give plant uh, areas or uh, specific technologies to a um, out on a concession or on a, a, a longer term partnering type agreement in terms of yeah. operating on behalf of uh, that on, on behalf of Eskom's uh, basis. So that's uh, more the consideration at this stage, Chris. Take a demineralized water uh, as a sort of a ring fenced. Operator to operate you know, maybe a fleet of demineralized water uh, facilities in the, in the Eskom operation. Is that the kind of thing you're thinking of? Yeah, in fact, in, in, on some of our stations, we're already making use um, of, uh, for instance, uh, a mobile demon plants to provide uh, um, you know, for us, demon water uh, that's running uh, in, in totality, operating, maintaining of that uh, facility by a supplier, uh, in order for us to be able to um, refurbish and and um, maintain the existing plant. Um, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, we have not gone that far to to consider taking uh, taking out such a, a plot, in, a, a existing plant in totality. But but the, that uh, you know uh, certainly I believe it is also within means to to actually do that. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking. I mean, if you look, for example, at Sassel uh, and Air Liquid, uh, I mean, Sassel sold its air separation assets to uh, Air Liquid, who operate on the Sassel's premises and provide Sassel with oxygen and I guess other uh, liquefied gases. Uh, but it, it just struck me that there are, could be opportunities for actually if you're either concessioning out or actually selling the assets and just buying, uh, you, know, you know, the finished product, uh, which could be, I don't know, uh, demineralized water, could be, um, you know, a crushed coal. I don't know. I'm not an expert on all of these things, but it seems to me that there could be some opportunities uh, for putting the you know the responsibility for reliable supply into the hands of, of of capable operators who can run it efficiently and cost effectively to everybody's benefit. Uh, okay, I think maybe uh, 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 Siemens, if if Tabo can, if you want to come in here, or even Iwet, if you'd like to come in on your thoughts on this concessioning model. Uh, if if I may, Chris, can I just opine? I think. Um, this topic is not new, um, and, and ourselves we've seen it in other sectors um, where we have been brought in um, on a similar approach. I think the the element that we often see that drives the decision on whether it's the whole plant or portions of the plant has to do with uh, the risk sharing. So which which parts of the plant that I'd like to um, let go, and I don't want the risk out of that. 
Um, and I think that that could be part of maybe as, as the conversation goes on, the details unfold as to what, what that could look like, because that gives a sense of uh, the boundaries and then obviously then the, the metrics around the performance that we could expect out of this, the, this model. But I think for me, the heart of this conversation and why it has perhaps come into uh, ESCOM realm, I think it's a sense of trying to get agility. Um, a lot of what the conversations are going on, it's around spares, uh, it's around outages, it's around uh, BE suppliers or OEMs and so on. And really what we are talking about, we're talking about a 24 seven operation that needs agility in response to day to day and hour to hour problems. And if you really want to address that and not hindered by all the other externalities, it may be then a consideration to look at this model. And I think in this case, it applies to that, to that perspective. The second element for me is that the minute you start becoming a lot more agile, you then are able to mobilize the right required skill sets and expertise. Because then you are able to respond quicker, then you're able to adhere to quality and best practices and so on. And I think for me, this is where the power of the module needs to be considered and not left behind. And it mustn't get lost into political uh, uh, spheres. It needs to be how do we uh, afford ourselves greater agility, a greater mobilization of skill sets so that we can get the right performance metrics that we need. And I think that it, it has its benefits. Thank you. Iwa, do you want to quickly come in here? Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, Chris, maybe from my perspective, we are selling steam to the smaller uh, users within the industry. So instead of them having a small boiler on site and maintaining it and running it, we're doing it for them and we're selling them the steam and they're buying that from us. And we're doing all the operations and maintenance uh, on the boiler. But that's more in response to that they don't want to have people on site that understands these things and able to run it uh, because that's not their main purpose. In ESCOM's case, this is not true. I think they have the skilled people they have the, uh, the right uh, sort of personnel and, and has built that over many years. And I think in ESCOM case, it's more of being able to push some of the performance requirements onto the OEMs. Because you cannot ask an OEM to guarantee the performance of the boiler if it's only maintaining the pressure parts and not look, including some of the ancillaries in his contract. And, and I think that should be the main driver behind it to improve the performance of the plant. And I think Tabu is exactly what you've said as well. Thanks uh, for those insights. Uh, I, I want to just move to you, Thomas. Uh, and please, there's, please. there's a question. There's Chris. a question from, yes, I'm here. Silas. Uh, sorry, who's that? Oh, oh Silas. Uh, Silas, sorry about that. I, 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 your window was covered by one of my other windows. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I didn't realize you had to say something, but please come in here. Chris, it's a, it's an, it's unfortunate that you know you 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 say you don't trust your baby anymore, and you you want some of what your baby should be doing to be done by somebody else, uh, your neighbor's child, to put it bluntly. So, uh, um, but Escom where they had been given the task of doing things themselves, they had not delivered those things on time. They have not brought us any saving. They've actually cost us more. And I think that's where Treasury was coming from. But uh, I would put it to you, Chris, that Treasury is not technical. A good example is on the incentive that they put for solar, uh, excluding the inverters and batteries. They just say solar panels, and that thing is not moving. Maybe Chris has to arrange it's a webinar with Treasury and the, and the right players. To me, all these power stations have been built where ESCOM has been a contract manager, OEMs have been suppliers and EPCs, and in some instances, there would be OMS for some time until they hand over. So private participation has always been there, and maybe that's the model we have to go back to. It's not true that they've not been uh, in, in, in the game. But... Uh, if, if you if you if you then look at the opportunity for us because we want the megawatts it's on the repurposing it's on the repurposing the question also has to come to the oems would you be ready for such 
where have you done it for us to then say you you are experienced on it you've always been selling to us and and installing and living and now we are saying come and be with us so at the end of the day nobody talks about the ppa that esco must still sign as an off taker nobody talks about the guarantees that treasury the same treasury has to issue that's my tax and yours so a webinar, a webinar would be my, my proposal on this one, Chris. Thank you. I will take up that challenge, uh, Silas. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it is uh, it is interesting. Um, I, I mean, you, you asked for some examples. I, I just think in terms of um, Kelvin Power Station, which is probably long since past the 40 or 50 year so-called life cycle, lifetime but continues operating today by um, by concessionaire, you might call it, it's not really a concessionaire, it's by an independent power producer now, uh, but they've taken that old asset and it continues to operate in one form or another and perform some form and, or and another. And I gave them the PPA, Chris. I gave them the exactly. PPA. But the same guys are in SAA as well now. So <laughs> why I'm saying webinar, we don't want the yeah. SAA route to come into the energy space. Yeah, the Kelvin true. is a good example. Yeah, and I agree with Next, you on uh, that. I, we, we take up the challenge. We'll take up that challenge. But I, I want to move to a last uh, issue that's been raised by Andrew Carr, um, and 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 he asked the questions uh, to the OEMs. Are you guys OEMs? That's original equipment manufacturers, or are you operating and maintenance companies? O and M. Uh, you know, we're talking about OEMs or O and M's. One is an original equipment manufacturer. One is an operations and, and, and maintenance uh, 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 company. Are you one or the other, or are you both? So maybe uh, Tava Governor, Deva Governor, if you can answer that. A simple answer, Chris, we are both. Either one you want us to be, we will be that. It's a matter of engagement in terms of, your, of your, what you need and what you require. Uh, I just want to comment on what Silas said about uh, conversions, and no one's spoken about that. Uh, our technology partner has done conversions worldwide. You just need to engage the OEMs on that. And that's why I go back to the issue of what are the role of OEMs. It's all about engagement. I default back to my last slide. We need to work there as a collective. There are a lot of things that OEMs are doing that is not well known within the industry. It's all about engagement and getting working as a collect collective and collaborating. Well, I hope, Andrew, that answers your question clearly that these guys are OEMs and O and M's, uh, and they uh, are equally good. But I, I think uh, one should also uh, acknowledge that a company like Eskim also may need some O and M capability uh, and not necessarily just, uh, you know, uh, abdicate its role uh, by handing over this to, to other players, as, as Silas has pointed out. Uh, you know, do you want to hand over your baby to somebody else to look after? Are they going to really look after it better than you're going to look after your own baby? I don't know. That's the question. Ha is Eskim looking after it? Has it been looking after its own baby? Look, I, I think we're going to draw an end to this webinar now. It's, uh, it is 11.30. Um, I would like to just ask uh, Silas. Silas, if you're still there, if you would like to just make some closing observations and, and say a few words just off the cuff, nothing uh, that requires any preparation, but any uh, messages you want to give us uh, from uh, yourself or from the minister, uh, having heard the OEMs and the role that they can play and your own intimate knowledge of the industry yourself. Well, uh, Chris, uh, firstly, again, thanks for arranging this. Uh, uh, thanks for arranging this important uh, webinar. I think, uh, you know, knowing my minister, You've seen him many times. Uh, he's like you. He's always appearing in our homes and TVs without being invited. But he would have liked to be here. Uh, and unfortunately, he couldn't. Uh, but uh, he didn't want us to miss the opportunity. The stakeholders that you've brought in, the message today is that we need to work together. The message from ESCOM is that we they, they, they are working on reviewing how they use OEMs. The OEMs are still here. They've not closed shop. We don't have all of them here. And, 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 and hence, we took that cabinet memo to say, can we have a cabinet memo allowing for OEMs to be engaged directly, you know, instead of middlemen, middlemen, middlemen. 
Now, removing those middlemen may not help in some instances. We don't want issues such as the trucks that have been banned. So we need to also look at the social platforms. How do we uh, engage some of those to be actually real business people and learn over time and one day be uh, uh, good to, to can deliver? But uh, I, I'm very, very excited with the openness of today. I'm happy with your neutrality of today. Uh, knowing that you had all the answers, you could have given the answers yourself because uh, uh, you engage us every day, Chris. <laughs> but uh, let this be not the, the only time that we engage on these matters, Chris. You know, I always say it all starts with electricity, then the economy follows. And if we all agree on it, this should not be a once-off. We need to discuss again so that we can stimulate our economy again. Another good example that I always tell you, the Africaners built power stations that we're talking about today, and they built and maintained them well. And I don't know who took them over and got them to where we are now. You know, we talk about the age of them and the performance. The old power stations, and, and Thomas can bear with me on this, have performed better than the new ones. So it's not by formula that we say it's age. They are aged. It's not true. The new ones are not performing. So we need to also have longer than uh, two, three hours. Chris, uh, we like you, so you can make it every day. And, and again, thanks a lot for this. I hope you will share with everybody that have uh, taken their time to join us, the information, the presentation, and the questions, if possible, so that we can then also follow up on them. And to all the delegates, yeah. thanks a lot. To the presenters, really, really appreciate it. Enjoy your day. Thank you. Thanks, Silas, uh, and that's uh, a very gratifying uh, message that you've given us and uh, encouragement to, to carry on, and we certainly will carry on. And uh, I uh, want to just uh, mention our next webinar, uh, which will be uh, next month, it is, will be announced in the next few days, is on a very important topic indeed, uh, a very topical issue, and that is uh, the move away from the single buyer model uh, through to, you remember, the, through the Renewable Energy IPP pr program, which was still a single buyer model, but involved uh, IPPs, um, uh, then through to uh, wheeling contracts, which are generally one-to-one -one wheeling arrangements. Uh, can, then they evolved to one-to-many and many-to-many. And now we are seeing the emergence of third-party electricity traders. And, uh, and then from there, there's a move to a full market mechanism. So uh, this evolutionary process from the single buyer to uh, a multi-market uh, approach in electricity and where we are at the moment is the emergence of traders. So we're gonna be having a webinar involving a number of third party traders uh, who will give us their insights on this uh, new, the emergence of these traders and, and the role they perform, the very, important value adding role they perform in the electricity sector. So you please watch the space, it will be announced shortly. And I'm very uh, confident that uh, it will be an excellent webinar um, uh, on, a, on a new topical subject. But uh, having said that, thank you very much indeed uh, to our presenters, uh, especially uh, to uh, our keynote presenters, Silas and Thomas, and to uh, Iwet, uh, Tawa and Tabo, for your really valuable contributions and the time and effort that you've put in today. Uh, thank you also to the audience uh, who, uh, without whom, you know, the, the, a, a webinar like this is pointless. We've had a great turnout, a lot of interest, and I want to assure everybody that everybody who registered to attend, even those that did not attend, will be receiving a report back, including links to download all the presentations, as well as a link to view the video recording of this webinar. So just to watch your inbox, it will be with you shortly. And we will also make that available uh, very widely publicly through our EE Business Intelligence email newsletter, which will come out in about a week's time. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for your attendance. And thank you to the presenters. And most particularly, thank you to our keynotes, uh, Silas and um, and, and uh, Silas and Thomas, thank you so much. Uh, uh, all the best and out, over and out from me.